What a great speaker tonight. And uh, thanks to Franco for, uh, for booking Dr. Gladney. And Dr. Larry Gladney, he's an American experimental particle physicist and cosmologist. And in 2019, he became professor of physics and the Phyllis A. Wallace Dean of Diversity and Faculty Development at Yale University. Before that, he was the Edmund J. and Louise W. Kahn Professor for Faculty Excellence and the Associate Dean for Natural Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. His research is focused on issues relating to the origins of the expansion of the universe following the Big Bang and on fundamental connections between matter, energy, space, and time. The recipient of many fellowships and prizes and a former visiting scholar at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Gladly was featured in 2006 Oral History conducted by History Makers, which is a digital archive project preserved at the Library of Congress that aims to document the contributions of African Americans to US history and American society. So please welcome uh, our first time here with uh, Dr. Gladney, Dr. Larry Gladney, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Dan, uh, for the kind introduction and also thanks to, uh, to Franco and the rest of the executive board for um, WAS for inviting me. Uh, I have to say that I've not talked to a, an astronomy crowd in a very long time. So um, forgive me if I'm a little rusty. I'm, gonna, I'm going to concentrate a lot on, on physics because um, I'm really uh, excited about a project that is gonna be coming online with First Light due just around the end of 2023. And hopefully uh, I can get all the rest of you interested in, in making use of it. Uh, I'm gonna try and talk a little bit about not only the science that it's gonna do, but also uh, how that science is gonna be shared uh, with pretty much everybody around the world that's, that's interested in doing astrophysics and cosmology. So uh, hopefully we can get the screen shared here. All right. Can everybody see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Right. So this is a, a mixture, as I said, of, of uh, a lot of physics and some astronomy uh, that has to do with, with my personal interests over the last 10 years, uh, which is to come up with a way of combining the communities that have been doing fundamental research on the constituents of the universe, you know, what makes up everything that we see around us. Uh, and uh, also uh, how that plays into the story of the, the universe is coming into being and developing into what we see it to be now. And so that's what's kind of indicated here on the, on the right-hand side is uh, a spotlight on space that goes all the way down to the level of, these are supposed to be tracks of, of subatomic particles. Uh, the question of how to combine the, the talents of, of people who've been doing particle physics for, for many years, as I have been, uh, and those who've been doing astronomical research, uh, really came down to trying to decide somewhere around the year 2000, 2002, uh, how we just go back to the most basic question of, of learning the story of the universe in terms of its history from as far back as you can, you can go to, to now. Uh, and doing that questioning in a sense that says, we're not gonna take anything as given knowledge in terms of you know, taking the best aspects of how people have been doing this research before, and then sort of just extrapolating what we can do with improved technology. It really was a, a kind of clean sheet approach. What do we need to do in order to answer the most, or at least having a chance to answer the most fundamental questions for both of these communities. And so what we came up with was something that sounds good uh, in, in the sense of how you sell this to, to politicians and to uh, funding agencies, but really was motivated by this idea that uh, discovery in the 21st century has to take a fundamentally different approach uh, at some point, right? Uh, you don't go revolutionizing everything at once, but in terms of how you do the science, you do expect that there will be some point at which everything that you've been doing before uh, doesn't really apply and you have to then rethink or think differently about how you're going to, to move forward. For me in particle physics, for example, it became clear to me that we weren't going to continue building ever larger particle accelerators that were uh, many miles in circumference and many billions of dollars uh, in expense, plus 10 to 20 years to build. 
Uh, and so it was really sort of the right time around 2002 for me to kind of rethink uh, this idea of maybe we should we should be working with another field like uh, astronomy and, and astrophysics in order to determine how we would find out things that we want to know about about particle physics and so the set of kind of principles that came into play uh, really re produced an idea that was fairly firm at least on paper by 2004 and it was essentially a design that answered the following set of questions so the first is that we should have a project which would be a worldwide project. In other words, it should take advantage of anybody around the world who wanted to contribute to both doing the, the uh, science and in designing the project to do that science. Uh, the second is that it was already understood that we have to make maximal use of computers. Uh, computational thinking is something that, of course, has been included in an awful lot of the tools but really what we're thinking here is that computers have to be used in a way that actually expands the capacity of the human mind to both be creative and to, uh, to uh, amplify our ability to pick out patterns. Uh, and we understood that that was gonna be true because on the particle physics side of things, we were already inundated in data, far too much for human beings to go scanning through images uh, or even um, uh, looking at uh, statistical uh, plots in order to find something that was really new and different. We have to make use of the fact that computers at that point were not where they are now, but we could extrapolate from where we had been in the 90s uh, in particle physics to say that this is going to revolutionize the way that we look and analyze, look at and analyze data. Uh, it hadn't yet come to astronomy and astrophysics, but uh, it was on the way. Uh, the next is that it was really important uh, to a bunch of the people who were engaged in this that there should be some impact beyond sort of the basic science. That's the, the motivation for us. But um, it was thought that, again, if it's going to be a worldwide project, we should make sure that it's capable somehow of having an impact on, on, uh, on being important to the progress of civilization. Uh, you can probably guess where this comes through uh, in, in an astronomy project, but I would say that it was important for people to understand that if we were going to have to eventually make technical trade-offs in order to get to the one piece of science as opposed to another piece of science, we wanted to make sure that we had decided ahead of time that that trade-off would have to not be at the expense of being able to, um, to look at ways in which uh, astronomy could actually help protect civilization. And then um, finally, we wanted to understand that if we mean that this is something that everybody is able to be excited about, we have to have at least some handle in the, in the design of the project that allows the data to be open for everyone to make discoveries. This was in the early days of sort of the open skies uh, provisions uh, for, for uh, observatories around the world. And it was decided again, really early on, right back in 2004, before we had even come up with the final version of the uh, technical specifications for the project, that uh, we were going to make all of the data available every day after we'd taken pictures the night before. And uh, of course, we didn't know that we would be able to do that because of course, uh, we depend on the national funding agencies to provide the actual money that goes into making the project, uh, but we understood that we could stand firm behind this idea that it has to be open to everyone. And if we did that from the beginning, at least nobody gets a surprise, right? If the funding agencies aren't going to go for that, then uh, we would hope that they would tell us that fairly early on in the project. And then um, to, to carry on from where the ambitions for this should go, uh, it was understood that every 10 years, of course, there's a decadal survey in the astrophysics community, which decides the prioritization for projects for the next decade. And we understood from 2004 that the next time that occurred was going to be in 2010. And consequently, we had to be in a position to make, of course, a pitch for a project that was ultimately going to be um, uh, more than a billion dollars in expense. Uh, to, to say to the scientific community that would be worth spending that amount of money. So for that, we 
came at it with the aspect that uh, it takes a number of years to actually build something. It takes a number of years to actually get data out of it and do the analysis. And then it takes a number of years to actually understand what you've got. That is, how do the questions that you have answered lead to the next set of questions? Uh, and in this case, we wanted to think pretty far ahead, not quite to the 22nd century, because nobody can really extrapolate that far. But we did want to say that there, there should be an aspect of this which would answer questions fundamentally uh, at a level and with an accuracy that we could be sure that there would be at least 20 to 50 years worth of exploration of what we found. In other words, it wasn't going to be something where uh, you, you spend a decade building it, a decade ana analyzing it, and then, of course, everybody is ready to move on to the next set of questions uh, that have come from any other uh, set of, of things that uh, people have been exploring. And for that, uh, this was where, of course, we saw that the connection between particle physics and astrophysics was really, uh, was really locked in, right? That uh, if we took the idea that we were going to be able to answer questions that locked the fundamental building blocks of the universe, which is the earliest history of the, of the universe, to what we see now, uh, in terms of how the structure of the universe is built literally from the, the bottom up, then in fact, uh, we, can't ha we can't help but be looking at questions that we're clearly not going to answer, but which are gonna excite people going forward, right? It's gonna be uh, aimed towards something that uh, has a long lifetime in terms of uh, the ability to, to say that there's scientific motivation to continue with it. And for that, the phrase that was used was use the universe as the laboratory. In other words, um, particle physicists are used to building a lab, uh, either with uh, a detector that sits on a tabletop or uh, literally something that is run as an accelerator uh, on the ground someplace. And in this case, uh, to bring that, that crowd in, we had to explain to them um, that the, the place where we're gathering the data is both controllable in the way that you expect the things that you do in the laboratory to be. And I don't mean by that, that we actually think that we could change the universe, but it means that we would be able to look at enough of the universe that people would be able to come up with various questions and then say, ah, but I need more data uh, cap captured in the form of, of images in order to, to be able to look at that. There would be basically no end of images that you could say, whatever question you come up with, there's going to be a set of images that gives you the data to access that. And this works out because of course, uh, telescopes are, are not just space machines, they're time machines. The further out you look because of the finite speed of light, uh, the further back in time that you're looking. And so we wanted a, a machine that would look deep enough that we're literally at the confusion limit where uh, at least in the optical, uh, you can't sort of decide between objects because they are so close together that, um, in fact, they, uh, they tend to, to merge uh, in a way that can't be resolved with any kind of technology that we could extrapolate from uh, in the early 2000s. So this was the idea. Um, what do we mean by the universe as a laboratory? Of course, we have to explain that. And so uh, this is the set of formulas, the only ones I'm going to show. Uh, but basically, it starts with uh, the Copernican principle, which is no special observers. Every place you happen to be in the universe and you look out, uh, what you see should not depend on where you are. That's extrapolated in modern terms into uh, the cosmological principle, which is if you look on large enough scales, and for this case, it's about 100 megaparsecs, the universe should statistically look the same at all locations. That's the homogeneous uh, constraint and in all directions, that's the isotropic constraint. So the, the universe should be both homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, we don't have any proof that it has to be, but if it's not, then in fact, that also tells us something because we would have to invent physics, uh, particle physics, that would actually explain how you get something that is, it is inhomogeneous or, or not, or anisotropic. Uh, but if you make those assumptions, then Einstein's theory of gravity tells you exactly how the uh, universe, along with a little bit of hydrodynamics and thermodynamics, tells you how the universe evolves from very, very early times. 
And that's the three equations that are listed here on the right, according to the um, Friedman Robertson uh, Lemaitre uh, Walker model. Um, I won't go into detail as to what they are, but but basically just describe in words uh, what they what they say. And so the first tells us that the um, rate at which we know we understand from Hubble in 1929 that the universe is expanding. Uh, this is the description of how that expansion changes as a function of time, uh, although it's written here in terms of distance. A is the, uh, is the standard ruler. Uh, if you, you can think of it, it's just a, an expression of the, uh, the average distance between galaxies. And uh, that's, that rate, um, the, the velocity of the universe, is strictly written down in terms of this uh, Greek parameter rho, which is the, the density of mass and energy, and k, the curve, the intrinsic curvature of the universe. So the idea is that it's a pretty simple equation, right? Uh, if you tell me how much stuff there is per unit volume in the universe, I can tell you how the uh, rate of expansion changes uh, as the universe gets larger and a, go, uh, a for example, uh, increases. Uh, we can also write down the rate of change of the rate of change, uh, the acceleration of the universe. And again, uh, it depends on the density of mass energy in a pretty simple formula. Uh, there's this other parameter P, which uh, we, we're just going to put into a fudge factor here called W effective. Uh, but basically, uh, what it says is, again, that if you tell me what the, the density of mass and energy in the universe is at any given time, any value for A, then I can tell you, extrapolate into the future what it's going to be, or at least uh, how the acceleration is going to change. And then finally, uh, there's a relationship between uh, this mass energy density and the scale factor, which basically just says that uh, the amount of stuff that's in the universe, the total amount of mass and energy is fixed. And so as the universe gets larger or smaller, the density has to change. So there's a connection between this uh, density parameter rho and the thing that it's, uh, sorry, and the thing that it's telling us um, uh, around the velocity and uh, the uh, acceleration. So the idea is these are pretty straightforward equations, right? Now, Einstein could be wrong, but if he's not, and he's so far got a pretty perfect track record, at least for the theory of gravity, uh, then in fact, uh, you can't get around these equations. And so literally, if these are wrong, then we have to go back to the drawing board for pretty much everything in physics, because it says that the universe is operating according to laws which we've explored on Earth, and we've broken the Copernican principle. Somehow, the fact that we've, we've discovered these laws on Earth means that they don't extrapolate to the rest of the universe. So somehow, there is something special about where we happen to be. So here's the instrument that is intended to do that. It's the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. This is an artist's uh, sketch of it. Uh, looks like a pretty normal uh, observatory, except that there are many more events on the site. Uh, this comes from the fact that it was understood that if you're going to build a fairly large telescope, that you spend an awful lot of the time when you might be viewing after dark uh, uh, getting to thermal equilibrium, which I'm sure you guys understand really well. And so uh, at this altitude, it was understood that you would need uh, the air spent enough that you would need lots of vents in order to make sure that you got uh, thermal equilibrium of the glass before you started observing. So that's the ideal picture. Um, what's inside that you don't see is the really special piece of this, which is the Simonier Survey Telescope. Uh, which is unlike any other telescope for reasons I'll describe, and contains at its focal plane uh, the most powerful camera that's ever been conceived, uh, let alone built. This is a real picture from last uh, January. Uh, it is essentially complete on the outside. The only thing that's missing that is now included, if I were to give you the picture from last, uh, last, last week, is that the cladding has been put on the, uh, the top part of here of the, of the dome. Uh, so it's located in Chile on a mountaintop, Cerro Pichon, uh, an 8.4 meter primary meter uh, uh, mirror with 6.5 uh, meter effective size uh, area, uh, a 9.6, almost 10 square degree field of view, and 3.2 billion pixels for the camera. 
uh, in six fi uh, filters going all the way from uh, the near ultraviolet into uh, the mid infrared. Um, so LSST was the was the acronym that was used for it. It used to stand for Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, but uh, as you probably know, eventually somebody has to buy the glass for the the borosilicate glass for the mirror, and that was Charles Simonier. So uh, it was understood that eventually we were going to have to change the name of the telescope. Uh, and so the telescope is now the Simonia telescope, but we still use LSST because that's how the community identifies it. Uh, but that stands now for the survey that that telescope is going to do for the first 10 years of the operation of this observatory, it's the legacy survey of space and time. Now, in comparison to telescopes that are currently on the drawing boards and being built around the world, uh, it looks pretty puny. Uh, even in comparison to uh, space telescopes like the JWST uh, is not much, not much smaller than what we're talking about here. And so it's not a large mirror in terms of, of what modern astronomy is capable of building, mm -hmm. but it is by far the largest uh, etendu, the product of mirror area and field of view size. Mm -hmm. So this is a monster as far as what we're able to actually see in every frame of every picture that's taken by the telescope. So for example, the camera is the largest built for astronomy. Um, you can just imagine this being the telephoto lens on, on your camera you have around your neck. Uh, and in back is this focal plane here with uh, the, uh, the uh, giga, gigapixel camera. Uh, and this is the size of the full moon on that focal plane. Mm -hmm. So just imagine looking at the sky, every picture that you take uh, with that much area. So why do we need that? Uh, well, the first is, as I said, we had to promise the particle physicists that we're trying to attract to the project, as well as the astrophysicists who might be working on other telescope projects, that they're gonna get more data out of this to answer any question they come up with, even before we've taken the data. Uh, any question that comes up, there's going to be, it's going to be possible for us to take images of that part of the sky that uh, at least can be seen from the southern, he southern hemisphere to answer that question. So just to give you some idea of the scope, uh, here in the blue box is the uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field, uh, which you saw in, in uh, some, of the, some of the slides that were, were shown just before my talk began. And you understand that for each one of those, you have to, you have to look for days and days and days uh, in order to get an image that shows you that these dark areas, which look like they're empty, are not actually empty at all, right? If we look back far enough, we can see the universe is actually full of stuff. It's just that the scale of the universe is so large that, uh, in fact, there's lots and lots of, of room in between each of these galaxies. But the number of galaxies is really large. Uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope will have a much larger field of view and operate in the infrared. But still, it will take years in order to fill in these, uh, uh, the images that we've got here. This, however, that you see before you is one frame of the LSST. <laughs> okay. So every time, a thousand times a night, you will be taking pictures of this much area for the entire screen. And over the course of 10 years, uh, the capability of stacking those images on top of each other to get the deepest images possible will be what's shown here. This is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, a five-year survey. Um, and again, with stacked images, this is how deep they got. This is a simulation of the same area as the Sloan, but after 10 years of survey by the LSST. And you can see that you're getting pretty close to the same resolution as the Hubble, but over this entire area and over half of the sky, right? The entire Southern Hemisphere that's visible. In order to ship that much data, um, we have to understand uh, that we need, first of all, uh, parallel lines that can actually take all of the data. Uh, all of it's gonna go to the, was gonna be the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, it's gonna be uh, Fermilab now, but uh, in any case, uh, there's a repository in it somewhere in Illinois that will receive the data and then ship it out to both France and into, uh, into Arizona where there will be repositories that can both store it and generate and software that will generate what are called alerts. That is to tell you everything that changes 
uh, from night to night in the, in the sky. Uh, we expect, just to give you some idea of the scope, about a million alerts per night, of which about 100,000 will actually be something that is real and new. That is something did change, and the thing that changed is something that we had not seen in the sky in the night before. Uh, the rest of that 900,000, uh, 900, uh, yeah, 900,000 or so, uh, maybe everything from artificial satellite tracks to, uh, you know, an airliner going through the field of view, uh, but, or, or some kind of, uh, some kind of unusual noise before we get that all filtered out. But in point of fact, there will be at least a hundred thousand things that have changed in the sky from night to night that have to be examined. But, uh, and again, way too much. Uh, to do it with even an army uh, of uh, scientists, but uh, is something that we'll have to adopt computers to do for us and tell us of that 100,000, how we prioritize which things we look at first. Now, the reason why we knew that we need such a wide field, of course, is that the universe is dynamic. And so I'm gonna repeat, showing some of the pictures you guys have already shown. Uh, galaxies collide, uh, stars explode. And again, uh, some of them explode so violently that they outshine the collective light of the tens of billions of other stars that they share the host galaxy with. Uh, depending on where they explode, you can get things like hypernovae, uh, which make for really grand displays. Uh, and of course, uh, again, um, you showed uh, wolf Rayet stars, uh, which are on their way to an explosion of some kind by shedding lots and lots of mass. In other words, there's just lots and lots of stuff that is changing. And if you've got a wide field of view, you've got a good way of cataloging how that change occurs over the course of 10 years. Everything that changes on timescales of days to, to years uh, within that decade is gonna be recorded somewhere in this digital movie. Now, of course, uh, if we're talking about the local neighborhood, um, we've got something even more interesting uh, to talk about as far as what we need to, uh, uh, to be watchful for. Uh, here, of course, uh, we know for a fact that we are struck by meteorites uh, at a pretty regular pace. Most of them are small enough that they simply burn up in the atmosphere and make pretty, uh, pretty displays for us to see a few times per year. Uh, but in most cases, what we've got to do is to worry about things that are not so small. And so what I'm putting up is, uh, is a plot from a study that was done by NASA. It was, it was sponsored by NASA last year. And essentially what they did was to pull together a bunch of experts from around the world, and they gave them a scenario. And the scenario was we've identified uh, a meteorite, which, or an asteroid, uh, which is somewhere between 140 to 500 meters across. And we've identified it six months before impact on Earth. What can you tell us what to do about that? Uh, and so the first thing that people noticed is that even though you've identified that it's definitely going to strike the earth, uh, and you can even narrow it down as much as to say it's going to hit somewhere within Europe, uh, what you see are the error ellipses for how uncertain the impact position is actually going to be from six months out. And what's relevant about that, of course, is that, uh, of course, if it's 140 meters or larger, that's going to be a, a very bad time for millions of people. Uh, but what you can see is that there's no possible way within six months of time that you can think about moving people out of the way, right? It's simply too large a damage area uh, to understand how we would actually make people safe by simply moving them away from the impact point. It was also understood that there is no technical solution to figuring out how to divert or destroy uh, something that's even 140 meters across. And so what's pretty clear here is that uh, we simply can't afford to have situations like uh, Chelios events, uh, where this is less than 20 meters, probably something like 13 meters across. And so of course it, uh, it's a bolide exploding in the atmosphere. Uh, but if we're surprised by this with something that's 140 meters, that's a very bad time for human civilization. So we simply got to find a way to extrapolate uh, the orbits that are going to uh, eventually come into contact with the Earth uh, over a much longer time range, that is predict those impacts long before they happen. 
So of course, this has been understood. And in 2005, uh, the US Congress gave a mandate to, call, to NASA calling for the discovery of all near Earth objects uh, with a completeness of about 90% for everything that's 140 meters or above. Uh, now, what you're seeing here is a fraction of the 18,000 near Earth objects we have already identified. Uh, this is the positions of essentially all of them, but only for part of the time up till uh, January of 2018. And so you can see it's a pretty complicated problem to solve because of course there's already 18,000 of them and we're discovering roughly 40 or so every week uh, with uh, everything from amateurs to professional uh, astronomers. And consequently, we've got a technical problem here, which is that the way that you find these things, of course, is you can't see them directly. They look like stars, they're pinpoints of light. Uh, and so the only way you can actually identify them is to see them move. So you have to take pictures of the same area of the sky night to night and see that there's something in the picture that is in different positions. And then of course you string those together in order to get the position of the uh, object on its orbit around the sun. Now, the problem with this is twofold. The first is that, first of all, this is computationally really expensive, uh, and it also requires an awful lot of data. Now, the a lot of data part we're going to satisfy because we are going to do a survey that does look at the same parts of the sky uh, every three to four nights. And consequently, we would be able to produce what are called tracklets, which is you simply show the motion of the object across the field of view and then you connect that with a line and then you figure out how to link the lines together in order to make a track. And then you see whether that track fits into a Keplerian orbit or not. The problem is that a, a reportable discovery is a track that unambiguously fits a Keplerian orbit that does not match to any of the 18,000 plus orbits that are already known. And that's, both, that's one problem. Like computationally, this is very expensive uh, as shown by one of my particle physics colleagues who got interested uh, in this problem computationally uh, because it really uh, made itself amenable to the kinds of techniques that we use, uh, neural networks and machine learning that we use in particle physics uh, to handle very large data sets. And so what he's talking about here is that of course, the computational piece that's expensive for us is the fact that if we were sitting above the North Pole of the sun, this would be pretty easy to do. But of course we don't do that. We sit on the earth that spins around its own axis and is also in orbit around the sun. And so we have to uncouple all of that in order to resolve the actual Keplerian orbit uh, and fit it into something that either does or does not intersect with the earth's orbit. And so what you see on the, on the right here is what that problem looks like. <laughs> uh, so obviously computationally, there is going to be a problem. It just takes a long time. And the more you get, the more things you put into the database, the harder that problem becomes. And in fact, it's even harder for LSST because we're going to increase the rate at which we find these NEOs by a factor between 10 and 100. And consequently, therefore, even night to night, you're bringing in so much data that it's impossible to actually, uh, using the standard techniques, to uh, figure out how to uh, not <laughs> violate the uh, prospect of not finding something before it's too late. So uh, this means, and I'm, I'm spending time talking about it even though it's not my research, because it, it exemplifies two pieces uh, to the project that we, we designed in again, going back to 2004. So the first is that this is a data science project as much as it is an astrophysics project or a particle physics project. Uh, we have to come up with new statistical tests in order to do things that people have been doing pretty well up till now. Simply because of the deluge of data makes it impossible for even the computational power we've got now and over the next decade to actually uh, use those techniques. So this is one uh, taken from computer science in which instead of trying to find tracks by linking together tracklets, uh, you take what's called a tracklet uh, less uh, approach which is you, you simply generate a simulation of test asteroids for whose orbit, of course, you've got all of the known parameters. And then you use that to actually form what would have been a tract for you. That is, if you form a line with uh, your test asteroid, 
and uh, an object that you, you think might be an asteroid from, from uh, two nights uh, to see its motion, then in fact, you can actually pretty quickly determine uh, which orbit is the actual orbit because you've already generated these in your simulation. And it turns out that it's really fast for computers to do what's called the Huff transform in order to match that. Uh, it's the same thing that we do in the LIGO experiment to look for gravitational waves, for example. So uh, this is something that actually is able to keep up. It increases about two order, by about two orders of magnitude, the ability to actually find uh, near Earth uh, um, orbiting asteroids. Uh, and it's exactly the same kind of thing that we will have to do in rethinking pretty much everything that we identify, supernova uh, to new galaxies, to clusters of galaxies, weak lensing, strong lensing, uh, quasars, pretty much everything is gonna need a new algorithm because the pace of discovery is going to increase by so much. So what's shown here is a, an animation, which you can find on YouTube uh, of the, um, um, basically the Mercator projection of the night sky with the galactic uh, South Pole and North Pole. From the Southern hemisphere, uh, what you can see is that we're putting colors onto pixels. Uh, the color uh, gives you identification of how many times we've covered that, that particular uh, pixel or area on the sky. And what's shown here is that uh, we needed a pretty sophisticated computer program that takes into account the science that we want to do and tells us how we have to move the telescope around to cover different areas of space in a way that optimizes the amount of data for each of those science projects that we know that we want to do. Now, there might be new science that we come up with we can take this and rerun it again uh, if we decide that, in fact, there's something really important that is not included in the science drivers that cause us to change this. But you can see it's not a, it's not a simple algorithm, right? Uh, we have to move around the sky quite a bit. Uh, and so there's a lot of optimization that's being done in terms of dust uh, that obscures certain targets that might be of interest, uh, for example, towards the center of our Milky Way. Uh, as well as certain times when um, we have to avoid the, the moon um, when it's up and so forth. So this is what the final picture is going to look like. 90% uh, of the observing time is for a particularly uniform survey. That is, we don't just mow the lawn, but we sweep it so that we're covering the, the entire night sky uh, every three to four nights uh, with scanning over the, the sky twice per night. After 10 years, you'll have half of the observable sky imaged about a hundred times in all six filters, and that forms the digital color movie. That constitutes something like a billion images, uh, 100 petabytes of data, which includes 20 billion distinct galaxies and 17 billion distinct identified stars. Uh, that in and of itself maybe is not so impressive, uh, except that, of course, we've got full information, photometric information on each of these at a level and at a depth that um, no other telescope can approach. And that's simply because we could pick a target in the sky and we might get a sharper image, say for example, through the JWST, but it won't be a visible light image. So we could put up another kind of space telescope that covers the optical range. And again, we could get really sharp images, uh, but those images would again have to be over a pretty narrow range of the sky. And consequently, you would have to know ahead of time where the interesting science is going to be. And what we have put into our assumption is that it's the whole sky, right? That we're not going to find that we're lucky enough that we can look in just a few places and have the examples that we need. Um, and so along the diagonal here are the science drivers, right? Discovery. Uh, dark energy and dark matter, solar system survey, mapping the Milky Way, um, and everything that changes in the universe, and of course, near Earth objects. Along the opposite diagonal uh, is the data science that we need to do, the, the actual uh, statistical techniques, and the way in which we make use of computers in more sophisticated, far more sophisticated ways than we've used before in order to chunk through all these images in order to find the interesting thing. But as I said, uh, it is right here at the heart of what we do, that we have to enable STEM education and public engagement. And so uh, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how we uh, try to ensure that we're able to do that. For the near Earth objects, I've already talked about this. There'll be up to 6 million minor planets discovered over the course of these 10 years. 
And it is by far the most cost-effective solution to satisfying the congressional mandate. In 2012, the National Academy of Sciences concluded uh, that in fact, what Congress had told NASA to do, which they mandated them to do, was functionally impossible. And it was impossible because at the time that they gave the uh, mandate, they did not give the money to actually build a dedicated mission in order to do that. And it would require a dedicated space mission or a set of ground observatories, again, dedicated in order to use standard telescop uh, telescopic techniques in order to satisfy the uh, requirement of finding everything above 140 meters. In LSST, all those pictures are there. Right, every one of those asteroids is there. And given the uh, technique that I just showed you, we will be able to identify them all. Now that doesn't come until 2034, but right now Congress has still not appropriated the money for NASA to do this. So in fact, it is an infinite amount of time right now, or at least a very far uh, long time into the future before we would able, be able to actually understand uh, how to predict orbits uh, a, a, a year or more in advance uh, when we eventually find one that even at the level of 50 meters would do serious damage, uh, even if it came down in the ocean. So we've got it, right, uh, in the sense that um, no matter what NASA does or what, what Congress pays it to do, we will actually have the capacity to do it uh, by, by uh, the year 2034. And the only way to do it faster is to appropriate really tens of millions of dollars to building a dedicated ground a set of ground observing you know, telescopes or to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to build a, a space uh, a space mission to do it. So let me just concentrate on dark energy and dark matter for the physics piece of this, uh, again, as an example of how the design for the survey has been set and why a survey is optimal, right? Uh, normally, if you build a new telescope, you're gonna have a set of people who more or less own the time on the telescope and they loan it out to uh, observers who give them a scientific program, tell them where they want the telescope to point on particular nights. Uh, they get issued those nights, they take the data, they go away, they do their analysis, they publish their papers. Uh, we're not doing that, right? There, there will be no guest observing program whatsoever for the first decade. So that's a pretty big thing. And it was hard to sell the astronomy community on that. I'm not sure that we've actually completely done that yet. Um, but let me, let, me, let me show why it's really necessary. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, an image or a artist's conception of a type 1a supernova, which occurs in binary stars, uh, in which one of the binaries has become a white dwarf. And over time, uh, it steals material from its, its companion that builds up on the surface until it gets to a large enough uh, density that it ignites thermonuclear runaway. Uh, the entire uh, uh, set of fuel uh, detonates. It detonates through the core of the white dwarf and both stars are destroyed. Uh, an extremely violent thing, uh, fairly rare, but it makes for a bright signal that can be seen across a good portion of the universe. But it also has the, uh, the characteristic that because the mechanism for explosion, if that is the correct mechanism for all of this, the type 1As that we identify is correct, then within a fa about a factor of two or so, you ought to get about the same amount of light out of each one of those explosions. And a factor of two is something that you can actually calibrate. Consequently, we think that it's possible to use these as standard candles. We know how bright they are at the explosion point, and so we can look at how bright they are here on Earth, use the one over R squared, one over distance squared uh, formula uh, to determine how much energy there was and understand what the peak brightness was. Uh, and then from the peak brightness, of course, we can determine, given the redshift, uh, how that compares to the uh, uh, to the expected brightness given a model for how the universe's expansion has proceeded from the time of explosion till now. Uh, we can also do something similar with quasars. Uh, they can similarly be calibrated to yield distances. And the reason why this is important and came out in a, in a, in a, a paper we went through in 2019 was because uh, what we see here in the cyan are all the points from all of the um, observations that had been made of type 1a supernova. 
they are pretty rare and you don't have dedicated telescopes usually to look for them, right? There really only been a few missions in which you've dedicated telescope time over a significant period uh, in order to find these things. And consequently, um, we have some filling in of this, but uh, if you were to look at this and blow it up, you'd see that the closer you get, the thinner the data becomes. And that's of course, because the further out we look, the bigger the volume that we're looking at to find these things. The closer we are, the less volume of space that we're looking at, and therefore the fewer of these type 1a supernovas we're gonna find. Uh, and that leads to a problem, which is that uh, we've got basically no way to extrapolate from this area, which is about as far as we, uh, about as far out as we can see from the ground. And that's because of course, uh, as the universe expands, uh, that means objects are usually moving away from us and that redshifts them. So even though the light of the explosion starts out very blue, by the time we are one and a half uh, in terms of redshift, uh, redshift factor away, uh, it's shifted to the part of the infrared spectrum, which is covered by water vapor in the atmosphere. So it, it's like trying to look through a glowing blanket, right? Uh, the atmosphere both glows and blocks light uh, in, the, in those wavelengths. So uh, what we have to do is to determine ways in which we can actually do the comparison between quasars, uh, which again are extremely bright, so we can see them very far out, and what we've got anchored here. And LSST solves both of those with a survey, because in that survey, we increase the rate at which we can discover quasars over any distance to, again, about 10 to 100 times. And we also increase the number of supernova that we can find even fairly close in because we're doing the survey of the entire night sky rather than having to search a particular area for which we may or may not see a supernova. So every night of LSST, because the uh, field of view is so large, we will have at least 12 type 1a supernova in the field of view night after night after night. Consequently, uh, what we expect is to do a much better job of nailing this down. Uh, if we discover more quasars, we can also calibrate them better. And consequently, we expect to narrow these goal points, which are the quasars down, so that they are uh, much better in terms of constraining this curve, which is a history, a curve of the history of the expansion rate of the universe uh, out to very, uh, very, very long times, very early times, I should say. Uh, about 10 million quasars are going to be discovered by, by the LSST mission. Uh, we can also measure the history of structure formation. As light from a distant source passes through uh, a concentration of matter uh, or mass of any kind, no matter what uh, it's caused by, uh, it bends, according to Einstein. So gravity attracts everything, including light. And consequently, even if there's stuff that does not emit light, if it lies between us and a bright source, like a, a quasar or uh, a bright blue galaxy, uh, we're, what we're going to see is that the position of that galaxy against the sky is both shifted in its position and distorted. Now, the shift in position we can't really determine, but the distortion, it turns out that we, we can. Again, with really sophisticated statistical techniques, even without knowing what the galaxy shape actually is, we can determine by how much it's distorted. And that's because for all of the galaxies uh, that happen to be in the near vicinity of this one, for example, uh, the distortion is going to be fairly similar. So even if those galaxies themselves are all different shapes, uh, the distortion that's gonna be added is mathematically going to be the same. Um, and consequently, we can determine what the shape of that distortion says about the concentration uh, and the distribution of matter in, um, in this target. And so we can look at, at, at redshift shells, which basically give us uh, distances a billion light years away, three billion light years away, six billion light years away. Uh, and we can determine how dark matter, for example, uh, pulls together clusters of, of galaxies uh, and forms them into things that look coherent by visible light. Uh, but also look coherent in terms of the dark matter distribution itself. And what we have already found is that the further back we look, the more ragged the structure is. So we can see that, first of all, it is surprising that there's any structure at all a billion years after the Big Bang, but there is. 
Uh, and what we also see is that we can see the development of that structure with time, which actually tells us two things. So the first is that it gives us an estimate of how much weight there is actually out there. Uh, and what we find is that uh, roughly uh, 10 times as much mass is in the form of invisible stuff as in the form of visible stuff. So consequently, uh, we've been lacking um, roughly about a factor of five or so uh, of the amount of, of mass necessary to explain the structure of the universe. Uh, and we now understand between five and 10 uh, that in fact, that's due to the fact that most of the stuff that's doing the gravity that pulls the structure together uh, is in fact not putting out light of its own. The second is that we have this other effect called dark energy, which is causing the rate of the expansion of the universe to speed up. And of course, its effect uh, depends on the volume of the universe. So as the universe gets bigger, the effect of dark uh, energy gets bigger <clears throat> because it's, it's tied to space itself. It might actually be a property of space. And consequently, the more space there is, the bigger the effect is. The more space you have, the faster the space expands. And consequently, uh, it's acting against the dark matter and working against this, the, uh, the uh, accumulation of matter that makes this structure. So uh, right now, gravitational lensing is the only way that we have of directly weighing the cosmic mass that's out there. Uh, but it tells us two things, both how much stuff there is, that is the rho, the um, mass energy density, and how it's distributed. And it also tells us uh, what the effect of anything that counteracts the gravitation of dark matter locally might be doing, which is pretty important. So if we put it all together, uh, we've got the six things or uh, yeah, five things, sorry, that I've, I've got described here. Uh, we can look at dark matter by simply taking catalogs of galaxies and quasars. We can look at this thing called dark energy by looking at the uh, distribution of supernova and quasars, and also by looking at weak lensing of galaxies. Uh, we can look at the solar system. Uh, we see everything, but of course, asteroids are the things that are easiest for us to, uh, to know that we will be able to catalog. And of course, the structure of the Milky Way. Uh, so we understand that galaxies, as I said, do collide. Our own Milky Way has, has had numerous collisions with uh, satellite, or, uh, satellite galaxies much smaller than itself. It's literally ripped them apart. And we can see that because we know over the, the last decade and a half that we've been able to formulate patterns of streams of stars, which uh, could only be from some accumulation that was tidally, uh, 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 tidally ripped apart by the Milky Way uh, in collision. So uh, we will be able to discover all such streams by virtue of being able to look to very, very dim stars uh, in very bright areas even, and, under, uh, and putting those together to understand what the history of the Milky Way has been over time. And then finally, we have the ability to look at the transient sky, variables, explosions, things that uh, we don't currently even know exist because they happen over such short timescales that we just haven't had a telescope that was looking in the area of the sky where this blink occurred at the time that we're looking. Gamma ray bursts, for example, were only discovered because satellite, uh, um, satellite detectors were put up to look for nuclear explosions for nuclear tests that were unannounced. And uh, in order to calibrate, they happened to turn out to deep space where the idea was that you would be seeing nothing and they saw these flashes go off. So uh, it just happens to be that um, because we've had such small fields of view for any telescopes that we put on the sky in the past, that there could be numerous things that we simply haven't caught because they're too short lived. And consequently, we don't know that they happen. Uh, a great example is that we now know that black holes collide and we can measure the, the uh, collisions through the uh, um, detection of gravitational waves. We know that neutron stars do the same. Um, are there flashes that are produced during those explosions? Well, um, we actually do have some evidence that there probably is. And now again, it's gonna be in the database, right? We will actually see every time that happens, uh, whether or not there was a flash of light uh, that associated with that as long as, as long as it lasts for more than a few hours. And of course it occurs in the Southern hemisphere. 
The last thing is that uh, we want to have a direct determination of the composition of the universe. Right now, ordinary matter accounts for, and sorry, this is uh, not up to scale here. It's actually 5% of the whole disk of mass energy that's out there. Uh, so about 20, 25% or so, uh, uh, about 20%, yeah, about 25% or so is in, in the form of dark matter. And a little bit less than 70% is in the form of, of the mass energy associated with whatever dark energy happens to be. Uh, the reason why it's important for us to, to get a better handle on that number, on these numbers, is that, first of all, uh, this is us. In fact, only a small portion of this is actually us, about a half percent uh, of the mass energy that's out there. Most of it's hydrogen and helium, which is important for stars, which is important for us, but uh, does not make, a, make us up. And the question of, of understanding how much dark energy there is is pretty crucial because we need to understand whether the amount actually is tied directly to the volume as a function of time. In other words, it's 70% now, but it also has to be consistent with being much smaller about five to seven billion years ago when we think that its effect first started to overtake the gravitation that's due largely to uh, dark matter and normal matter. So the question of this accounting um, is, is one of the central questions that people like me are interested in because it tells us something that we can't learn in any particle accelerator. Uh, we can't generate dark energy. Uh, up, to, up to this date, we have not found a way to actually generate anything that could be a candidate for dark matter either. Hopefully that will be fixed at some point in time, but we don't know. Uh, and in fact, by using the universe as a laboratory, we can probably determine characteristics of both to as much accuracy as we could ever hope to do it in a lab. So I said that I would talk about uh, the data mining piece. Uh, we need pretty sophisticated software processes that go through uh, 20,000 gigabytes per night uh, to make 20 trillion separate measurements. Uh, that's basically just uh, points of light for which we're doing photometry uh, distributions. Uh, and then identifying things that are easy to characterize in a very short period of time. Uh, for example, you can look at quasar candidates. We can also look for supernova candidates. We can look for asteroid candidates. Those are all things for which uh, the software can do a pretty sophisticated job before human being has looked at it of telling you that there's a good likelihood that what we've identified is actually this. So we're pretty confident that we will be able to identify the 12, say, uh, type 1a supernova in our field uh, from night to night. These science drivers, however, also require very similar so hardware and software systems. We didn't know for certain that that would be true. As I said, we anticipated that there might have to be trade-offs that are made to do one kind of science versus another. But it turns out that when we look at it in detail, uh, that in fact, you need pretty much the same kind of system and the same kind of uh, approach to using those systems in order to get all of the science that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, and that's why in the end, we came down with nine tenths of the time being spent on a uniform survey. There's no reason to try and target any particular kind of object in order to get better science because we've actually shown that you get more data and get that data to uh, further out in the universe's history with a uniform survey. So to end with, um, I'll just talk about education, which as I said, we want it to be a central piece of what we did. Uh, so I mentioned alerts being sent out, alert packets of the transient and variable data derived from the prompt nightly processing will be available to anybody in the world the night, uh, the uh, morning after the data has been taken. Uh, so, you know, why does the government spend a billion dollars uh, to, put, to put this thing together and then say that we're giving all the data away? Uh, and of course, um, uh, I'm kind of lying, right? This is uh, a little bit like what I tell my, my, my uh, first year students in physics, taking their first college physics course. Uh, it's a little bit like Scientology. Uh, we tell you some truth and a little bit of lie. And then as you go further, the lie is kind of reduced in size, okay? So the lie here is that yes, the data is available, but there's so much of it. Nobody could possibly make use of it without the computational tools that the uh, collaboration and their various science collaborations that are doing this are gonna have access to. So yes, the data is out there, but you won't really be able to make use of it 
without making use of the, the kinds of, of uh, uh, handles that we can provide in order to, to make use of it. Um, on the other hand, we do intend to, to make those tools. And so uh, the education and public outreach was planned and actually constructed with exactly the same priority as the telescope and the camera. It had scientists, it had engineers. The only thing that it had that was different was professional educators uh, and professional science communicators to actually work up what the best tools are that would be usable by people who are not necessarily themselves scientists like students. Uh, and these tools are, are being designed and produced around four audiences. The general public gets a website that basically just gets updated every day that kind of says, here's the news of what's been found uh, during, the, during the survey. Formal educators get uh, a set of tools which are particularly well tested and uh, calibrated by taking actual data of how they work in the classroom, which is happening now uh, with simulated data, um, to determine ways in which you can optimize the teaching that you're capable of doing with this. These are mostly aimed at advanced high school and college level courses, but I, I can say that uh, 10 years from today, uh, I. <laughs> I will be crying on my keyboard if we're still teaching introductory astronomy courses the way we do now. Um, it's important to have people still go and use binoculars and telescopes and just naked eye uh, to get a sense of the sky. But since you have so much data available uh, with so many things that are already gonna be identified for you in these tools, you can ask your own set of questions and students therefore can be directed towards how to do science much closer to the way scientists actually do it. Uh, so that you know that they can actually get to an answer without having everything be canned in a way that makes sure that they can do so. Uh, and then the last, uh, sorry, the next to last is planetariums and uh, informal science centers. Uh, this is basically movies. So we can, we can produce each year some piece of the digital movie uh, that determines, um, and I thought I would show you one of them, but um, I, I won't have time but there is one on YouTube already that's been done with, uh, with data that gives you some idea about how you take this and fit it into a way of actually zooming your way through the universe to particular targets so that you can actually see not only the target itself, but everything around it and in between Earth and, and getting here. And then finally, citizen scientists, researchers, uh, the tools will be there. Uh, they're actually gonna be available later this year in Zooniverse. Uh, so that you can put together your own plan, no matter who you are, where you are around the world, if you have access to the internet, uh, these tools allow you to use your web browser to propose a plan. And if that plan is approved, you get access to the data along with the tools necessary to do whatever analysis you propose. Uh, as a citizen scientist, you can do research right alongside everybody who's been working on this for the better part of 15 years so far. Uh, and it doesn't matter how deep it is. So basically, if you've got an idea, you can actually get access to the data and the tools to make use of that data uh, in a large stream. Uh, part of the reason we know that we can do that is that uh, in late 2020, Google joined on to store the astronomy data in the cloud from the observatory. So the last thing is education um, for the next generation of scientists. Uh, this is not part of the project. This is taken on by a nonprofit corporation uh, for which I've been on the executive board for the last six years uh, that has started with uh, getting money from foundations and private individuals to do things that we can't get the US government to actually fund, which is they know how to define missions, which is you will build this to this specification over this time period, and then it will operate with a budget of so many dollars per year, so many people. Uh, what they are really not good at doing is saying, how do we prepare people to actually make use, optimal use of all the data that's provided by this incredibly elaborate design? That they don't pay for, because of course, there are many people who are doing research with data taken by instruments that exist today. And um, consequently, when you go through peer review, people will say, well, you know, data in hand versus uh, what you want to do to train people to look at data that comes tomorrow. So it just never makes it through. Uh, and so we've decided to try and fund as much of it as we can ourselves, which is to train, train a new generation of data scientists to look at both astronomy and physics. 
Uh, this is done through what's called LINK, the LSST Interdisciplinary Network for Collaboration and Computing, uh, which makes use of two things. The first is that we have an inside uh, knowledge of how the project is being constructed. And so we know what kind of analysis tools are going to be key to meeting the science goals. The next thing is that the training and mentoring of future scientific leaders uh, should really be somebody's responsibility. We could say it's left up to universities, but in fact, universities, um, you know, train for the generalist, right? Um, what we're talking about is training people to do science the way science is going to be done over the next at least half century, uh, which is to, to make optimal use of computing skills in order to come up with answers. And then the last is that we're, we're talking about producing a new set of scientists and consequently there's no reason for them to reproduce the lack of inclusivity that has been true uh, in the field, uh, certainly in, in the uh, top, top research universities uh, over the last few decades. That is, it can be a more inclusive community because we're actually planning it to be such. Uh, so the LSST Corporation, as I said, uh, is out there. Um, if you feel so inclined to, uh, to donate to the cause, uh, either time, money, or expertise, uh, please do so. The idea of, of generating the set of people who are gonna be making use of this data and then generating the questions that come up over the next, the next few decades is terribly important. So let me just uh, end by saying that it's pretty significant that this is the first major observatory named for a actual woman astronomer, Vera C. Rubin, uh, who actually kicked us off on the whole idea that there might be large amounts of dark matter out there in the universe. And so with that, I'll stop and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. That was great. Thanks, Doc. That was, uh, yeah, for not having done these for a while, I think uh, <laughs> that, that worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I had a question too. I, I guess I'll start off here. I see there's a couple of questions in, in YouTube. But, you know, I kept thinking about this massive amount of data that the LSST is going to put together. It's, it's like a tsunami. I mean, what, 60 petabytes over 10 years? I mean, how do you how do you even keep all that? Is that the plan is to try and keep all that stuff? I know there's a supercomputer on site to try and pick out that million um, of those pieces. But how do you I mean, what do you how do you handle that kind of information? It's a fire hose, literally. Yeah, it is. Uh, and so, as I said, everything that we think about doing in terms of analysis has to be completely rethought in terms of having um, particularly machine learning techniques in order to, to take at, at certainly the first pass of the data and probably the, the second as well before we actually have people um, entering into trying to look through it. So uh, first, the storage piece of it. That actually turns out to be not too hard to do. Um, even at 100 petabytes, and by the way, we'll probably have two to three times that much in simulated data in order to carry out these machine learning techniques. So you have to, you have to train the machine learning um, algorithms. Um, that turns out to be actually not as large as the data sets that already exist for Citibank, <laughs> MasterCard, Visa, and so forth. Uh, so, in fact, we already do know technically how to store that much data. What we don't know how to do is, to, is how to put it into the cloud to make a Google universe. Uh, but that's something that Google seems to be pretty interested in working on uh, around how do you interface human beings to that much data so that it does a lot of the looking around for you as part of the algorithm without uh, introducing um, bias, right, um, which is tough to do, but again, machine learning algorithms actually do seem to be capable of doing miraculous things uh, in exploring data the way that people would, but avoiding the kind of biases that people tend to be subject to. Now, again, if you train them with the wrong data set, they actually introduce, they create new biases that people don't necessarily have. Uh, so you have to be fairly careful that as we are gathering the data in, we're making constant checks of whether the simulated data that we're using to analyze the real data uh, is actually close enough to the real data in all of its characteristics to make sure that the machine learning algorithms are, are doing the right thing. But that's how you have to handle it, right? The computers have to do the bulk of the work, which is uh, by the time it gets down to people looking at it, 
uh, you pretty much have done everything that needs to be done to, first of all, determine that it's interesting and worth your time. And second, that you've got some hope of figuring it out. So one of the more interesting projects uh, that groups here have been working on at Yale is, okay, that's great for the things that you know are interesting, but what about the things you don't know are interesting, yeah. which is one of the things that astronomers, of course, love to discover things. Uh, but it turns out machine learning can actually do that as well. It can actually categorize how weird is this? <laughs> so it can look for things and actually give you a quantitative measure of how different this is than anything else that it's ever seen before. And so there will just be a bucket of these things in which basically strange things go in here, strangest things go there, and things that the algorithm has absolutely no idea what it is go into this bucket. Uh, probably what we'll find is that that strangest bucket is some kind of instrumental uh, you know, uh, uh, error of some kind, uh, and we throw most of those out. But it is possible to actually have a pretty good confidence that anything that's really strange that we haven't identified before uh, is actually going to be in one of those buckets. And consequently, um, uh, we just have to hope it's at a low enough level that the universe is not full of strange things that we can actually have people go through it. Like the alien bucket. We don't... Uh... The alien bucket. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, right. yeah. So, um, yeah, and again, too, if you have some questions tonight for uh, Dr. Gladly, uh, Gladney, please put them in uh, right now and we'll get to them. Over on YouTube, um, Stephen Schreier is uh, watching from Kalamazoo, Michigan. He's got some good questions in here, too. So uh, could antimatter stars be possible someplace in the universe? Is that a possibility? Is that something we could see? Uh, it's unlikely, and the reason for that is that we, uh, again, in combinations of, of particle physics and, and uh, cosmology, astrophysics uh, researchers, there, there have been gamma ray telescopes put up. The Fermi, for example, uh, gamma ray telescope has done a pretty extensive examination of the gamma ray sky. Um, if there's antimatter, then again, we would have to violate the Copernican principle. It either has to be completely isolated from all of the matter, or it ought to be generating a lot of gamma rays. And we would be able to actually see that concentration of gamma rays in the sky. Uh, what we've seen so far are only point sources or very close to point sources, not distributed and diffuse, uh, which means that it's unlikely that there's a big you know, a mixture of, of gamma rays and, uh, sorry, of, of antimatter and matter that's any place that's uh, been visible to the Fermi uh, telescope. Uh, that being said, um, again, if we're looking for strange things, uh, again, if it turns out that for any reason um, there's like accumulations of antimatter, not in, in uh, a, a dense form, but kind of spread out over some, some region of space, um, that actually potentially has some, some measure of interference with the way light behaves uh, from distant objects that are, where the light is coming to us from those. Um, I don't know that anybody's worked out exactly what that should look like, but uh, it is possible uh, because grains can become charged over time. And consequently, um, uh, if there's ionization that it takes place, uh, it will look different for, for antimatter matter than it does for matter because the charges are all reversed. It's the electrons that are easiest to move, so it's the positrons that come off. So it might be possible to actually, again, spot something if there's diffuse amounts of antimatter out there with light from regular matter coming through it. So we could even see potentially a dark matter star, if that would even exist. Is that something that's a possibility of discovery? Yeah, um, we would be able to actually see it to pretty far distances because of the gravitational lensing that it causes, right? Um, right now, if there were a dark matter star in our, again, it would have to be not in the plane of the Milky Way, but high enough above. Uh, people have done micro lensing examinations, which actually prove that um, the density of these, of these things has to be below a pretty small limit. Uh, and LSST would be able to take that out to other galaxies as well. So microlensing is one of the ways that we've been able to use it to actually discover a handful of, of uh, extrasolar planets uh, by seeing the planet actually distort star, starlight that comes uh, from a, a more distant source. 
Uh, so we've actually determined the statistics that need to be done to determine gravitational lensing to pretty high accuracy uh, fairly well right now. Another question from uh, Steve Schreier. Um, we believe space is expanding faster than the speed of light. If you could just sort of pop to that end of that bubble there and see and get to the edge of the universe where it is today, would we see a whole bunch of supernovas going off all at the same time or would you just see nothing at all? So the answer is uh, we don't know because it's it's beyond our ability to kind of speculate uh, what might have happened early in the universe's history. Uh, so if we go over the the Hubble horizon, uh, the expectation is that it should look pretty similar to what we see now, uh, simply because we don't know any particular physics mechanism that would uh, would say that it ought to have been different. Uh, really, there are, you know, the assumption is that there are no special places in the universe. And so everything has experienced pretty much the same kinds of, of physical conditions uh, as the, again, we have to go out to large enough areas, you know, um, 100 parse, uh, megaparsecs or so. But over that range, uh, what we expect is that the physics should have been pretty uniform. And consequently, there's nothing special about the fact that this stuff is really far away, right? We're, we're just as far away from it by uh, an observer who happens to be out there. Great. Is there uh, any other questions from uh, the peanut gallery in here from any of our panelists? Yes, we have a question on Q&A in Zoom from uh, Kazav Nair asks, uh, will the LSST be able to answer the enigma of planet nine or discover rogue stars and planets? Uh, so the answer is yes, but I, I kind of think that that mystery will be solved before we get there. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, I had a question of my own. Uh, given the amount of data that the, this is going to produce and uh, how much has to be untangled just to begin with to see if there's some interesting transient or some uh, new thing, how much of a monkey wrench are 30,000 Starlink satellites going to throw into this? <laughs> uh, so let's see. Uh, there are things that I could probably say, and there are things that I have to, uh, I have to basically just tell you they are guesses. Uh, and the reason why I tell you they are guesses is because uh, I actually sit on the... Um, scientific advisory uh, panel for Lawrence Livermore. Um, so there, there, are, there are pieces of information here which are, <laughs> which are uh, um, not discussable uh, because uh, um, of various security uh, constraints. Um, so I'll just tell you what the, what the issue is. Uh, so the Starlink satellites are all known orbits. So it's actually fairly easy for us to come up, not us, but Livermore uh, is most likely the place where this is gonna take place, uh, is most likely going to be, find it fairly easy to take them out. And so you'll lose some data, but that's okay. You've got plenty of data. Uh, the problem is that you will also identify the orbits of artificial satellites, which have not been announced. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in point of fact, I will not be able to see that data, right? I won't even be able to see the tracks that are taken out uh, in order to eliminate those satellites because, of course, that would be suspicious to see this blank set of pixels gotcha. uh, that looks like it follows an orbit. So, there will have to be, I'm guessing, uh, there will have to be an organization like Lawrence Livermore, which is part of LSST, uh, who is going to be tasked with removing those satellite tracks. Got to hide of, license plates. Got and, it. Yeah, and then putting in a little bit of noise of some kind to obscure um, the ones that we're not supposed to know about. Interesting. <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, I just have uh, one last one that maybe we could wrap with. But tell us a little bit about uh, kind of your path to the job that you have now. I mean, a little bit of your background. I know I gave you a, a kind of an overview of, of a few things just recently, but I mean, how did you end up on the path that you took to be where you're at now? 
Um, yeah, I, I don't know when I wasn't on it, so I can't really tell you. Um, I wanted to be a scientist since the age of three, I'm told. Uh, and it was physics was the science because I hated biology. I hated chemistry. Um, it was too cold to do astronomy when I was young. So um, basically, it's always been physics and it's always been um, aimed at cosmology. But when I came up in college, uh, I was told by a, a, a working experimental astrophysicist that you don't want to do astrophysics because it was the late 70s. And he said, it's not going to be a reputable field if you insist on doing experimental work until the 90s. And he was exactly right, <laughs> basically. Uh, it was that long before we actually understood enough about astrophysics to be able to put reliable uh, systematic errors on, on measurements of things that related to the universe as a whole, which is what I was interested in. So he directed me to the particle physics guys down in the basement. And uh, that's where I wound up. But I'd always intended to come back here. And so um, in 2004, I'd spent basically 20 years working on particle physics experiment. And it was time to, to decide to go off to CERN in Switzerland. And I, I didn't. <laughs> so uh, instead, I, I turned left instead of right. And I went to uh, Lawrence Berkeley and just decided to spend time with the particle physics people who had moved over to astrophysics. This was in 2004, uh, 2003 rather. And they first job they gave me was to design a space telescope that would look at dark energy. Had no idea what I was doing, um, but it was exactly the same experience in particle physics when I started as a, as a, a freshman. And so it felt very familiar. So, um, I just got caught up. The, you know, they were really interesting people to talk to, uh, and they allowed me to talk to other astronomers. <laughs> so uh, we we had to figure out how to have a common language. I mean, it's all the interesting things that come up with uh, with engaging with these with uh, people who are doing science that you don't do, but is just similar enough that uh, you spend a lot of time trying to reinvent. Uh, your way of thinking about it. So it's like a, a year of going back to graduate school, right? Learning how telescopes work, how filters work, uh, you know, uh, what, what's a K correction. I mean, just <laughs> all kinds of things. Uh, I was in a, a kid in a candy store, right? You just, you find there's not only, I was at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, not only are there questions all around the place, but there, there are people right next door who can answer them. You just pop in. And uh, it was really exciting. Um, unfortunately, the space telescope didn't get built because uh, it was too expensive. And um, that's when I turned to the LSST project around 2008. And um, at that point, my job was uh, to figure out why a, teles a space telescope was a lot better than a ground-based telescope. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were the enemy. So I was really all set up basically to turn all of the weaknesses into, uh, into strengths. Uh, and consequently, you know, there was a, a natural home. Uh, and then I, for a long time, I was at Penn for 30 years. Uh, Penn became kind of um, a hub for, for really thinking that the LSST could be a real project. Uh, remember at this time, we're doing a survey. Astronomers are not gonna have any time on this this was not a popular thing, right? And so when the decadal survey came up, uh, we were really expecting that if we didn't have a really strong argument, that this would just be shot down, right? It would be given no priority and consequently it would never get funded. Um, and I'd already had one, one project unfunded under me. So uh, we decided to take it pretty seriously and Penn uh, became kind of a, uh, one of the leading institutions along with Berkeley uh, and the uh, uh, University of Washington, University of Michigan, uh, all decided basically the astrophysicist and the high energy physicist, particle physicists, all kind of decided to join in on this. So it was a real kumbaya moment. So I was really sold on it from then on. Well, what a great path. And, and thank you that uh, your path led us led you to us tonight. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. And, and, and thank you. And, and please, you know, you're, you're a neighbor, so come down and, 
and hang out with us one of these nights. We do public nights, you know, Wednesday nights. If you want to look and see some stuff up in the sky, we uh, we're here to lower your expectations. Like we okay. always do. <laughs> Don't forget that uh, next month it is the picnic. We're going to reelect Shannon again because <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> and we're going to grill up some burgers and weenies and uh, whatnot. So uh, it'll be a good time. Uh, that's on uh, June 21st, the uh, summer solstice. So again, thank you to everybody that showed up today. Thank you, Dr. Gladney, for your time hey, tonight. You. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you uh, hopefully under, uh, hopefully no rain. <laughs> hopefully no <laughs> rain on the 21st, but uh, we'll be there anyway. So thanks, everybody. We'll nice. see you next thanks. time. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.